Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with a secret history living inside your aquarium. So, one of the things I get asked all the time is about shrimp, specifically cherry shrimp. That's uh, Neocaridina, Zangengensis, uh, Palmata, David Eye. Uh, really, uh, it, they're kind of all a mix. And if anybody says they know for sure what line of wild shrimp their shrimp came from it's probably a guess unless it's a uh, wild strain that was caught recently all the colors have been mixed around and proprietarily kind of uh, people in asia for the most part in the 90s and early 2000s were catching wild forms and they didn't want their competition to know what they used and so sometimes false information was put out as in who uh, mutated into what and so forth. So long story short, Neocaridina are probably one of the hardiest shrimp. I would say that they, along with uh, Caridina, uh, Bobal uh, Bobalti Caridinas, um, whether that's the chameleon or the rainbow or the neon green, those are pretty hardy as well. A lot of them come from India, the Middle East, and even like Egypt and the Sudan uh, area. And they're starting to get into the hobby more. But they, uh, these shrimp that are used to these big tidal surges up rivers and floods and dams and uh, marshes and things, all these different environments that they traverse in their lifetime they can withstand quite a bit of change. But in the wild, other than a monsoon or a flood, which actually would lower the TDS, and if you notice, most shrimp species, like the Caridina, the King Kongs, the uh, you know, crystals, things like that, their problem is never when there's low TDS, um, except for molting. You know, they need a little bit of calcium and stuff. But for the most part, their bigger problem is when the water has too much stuff in it. And so that TDS is only going to dissolve more. So in, in the areas where they're from, like Taiwan, China, Vietnam, those shrimp, uh, Japan, when it rains, you get more water. The pH will actually rise from what it is in a jungle. Because in the jungle, you've got... Uh, some places you do have limestone and harder water, but for the most part, you're going to have water uh, that's flowing quite a bit. It's raining a lot, uh, and so it's moving constantly, and that causes uh, the, the, the leaves and things to break down and become slightly acidic, maybe 6.0 or something. It can get really crazy in some jungles uh, over peat bogs and things like that and drop to really low numbers, but... When it rains and monsoon comes and the river rises, you know, 15, 20 feet in some areas, uh, you're just going to get lower TDS uh, and more neutral water, which would be a, ri a rise in pH or a lowering of acidity, to say it another way. So, that was a lot of yakking about uh, shrimp. So, what I want to show you here is some of the shrimp I have. And we got one here. I caught it in a turkey baster. Man, these things are useful. And what I wanted to show you is I put this guy out here. No filtration in this tub. No feeding him. So there's algae and uh, let me get a better shot of him. There's algae and I think I put some flake food in there just to get it started. Just to get the microbes eating. The first day, and literally other than that, no food, no shrimp pellets, nothing, nothing at all like that. So, I put these shrimp out in April. They went all through the summer. The hottest I recorded the water in a video that you may have seen online is it reached up to, uh, up to 86 degrees in the water. That was the day where it was almost 100 out. Now, in here, I should have three shrimp uh, that I have not put back in the house yet. These shrimp did not breed very well, but they have gone from 86 degrees in this water. The pH now is, uh, is a low. It started a little bit higher. There was some crushed coral and things like that in here. So we had uh, 
around a 7.5 pH um, and a TDS of around uh, 100, which is pretty low, um, when this started. Well, then all sorts of uh, leaves and things blow into the carport area here from the, the neighbor's garden and the trees. And it kind of turned into green water in these basins. In this basin over here, uh, I kept a number of danios. Over here, more danios and shrimp and snails. Snails, actually, the snails in this container here passed away. Now, I would only top it off without dechlorinator. Uh, I would top it off maybe 10% when I'd see that it had evaporated. I've let it go all the way, so to speak, down because um, I'm kind of seeing at the expense of several shrimp I was seeing how far I could push them. Now, I've had shrimp overwinter in Seattle, here in the Puget Sound area. I've had them overwinter in deeper ponds with a muddy substrate where they can bury themselves. Now, here, I've noticed that they're only active at night. They do not seem to come out for anything. The brightly colored shrimp were quickly eaten by all the raccoons. Um, so they were out of the picture rather swiftly. Uh, there were lots of mosquito larvae laid in here, but last night it got down to 34 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what, one degree Celsius. Um, and so it's time to bring them in. They're not going to withstand a freeze, I wouldn't think, in this water. And that was pretty close. I mean, I don't know how cold the water got, but I'm going to guess that it got under 40 degrees the water was at least uh, 52 degrees the other day when I had my thermometer on me in the daytime needless to say at night so let's see if there's any more shrimp I saw one there I don't know if you guys caught that but we'll carefully try to rescue the last holdout there he is right there he's going nuts we'll try to get him with the turkey baster but you see he's hiding and wow, that is a nice looking, that is a nice looking, hold on, let me put my finger over, over this guy so you guys can focus on it. But we have a nice looking shrimp in there. And healthy blue, uh, looks like he's kind of, uh, if, if we could get the light a little bit better, looks like he's kind of a really uh, shrimp. But yeah, he did. He made it through the 35 degree weather. So into uh, this container you go with your buddy. Uh, I think I'm guessing the the last of the other the third one I haven't seen in a few days. So I'm guessing it's gone. Uh, may have gotten dead or eaten. I don't. I just don't know. I'll come and look again for it, but I checked kind of before the video, um, and they do bur burrow into these rocks quite a bit, so, okay, so, these shrimp here have survived, uh, through it all, this one was very blue and nice looking when he put, when I put him outside, and let's get to better, a spot where I can set this down, and you can see just how how blue he was but basically what I'm trying to point out is that shrimp especially neocaridina they can withstand almost anything within reason it's just a matter of how quickly you do it so they need time to adapt and if I were to throw these guys in the 75 degree water they'd probably freak out in fact, they're freaking out a little bit right now. That one's holding on to the other one just because they're in clean water. I should have done a drip acclimation, but this is this whole thing has really been kind of a study in how far I can push it in the Northwest. Now, at the beginning of summer, late spring, we had some buried shrimp. If I'd put filtration in, I there's no doubt that it, they'd be fine. This shrimp literally... Uh, was all blue with lighter blue midsection. I thought that it was a really possibly and Now as you can probably see he is not or she is not very Blue anymore more like a green or off color 
So, um, in any case, I just thought I'd share that with you guys. And, you know, so you can see uh, the plants are all turning colors, the leaves are all dropping. Um, uh, you know, the maple trees and things like that are turning, even the sticker uh, blackberry bushes are turning colors. So, um, it is that time of the year. But, I just wanted to highlight, I'm amazed at how well they did here this year. Uh, and I think more people should try them as an outdoor uh, pond critter. Uh, if, if there had been uh, fish with them that were like goldfish, I don't think that would have worked at all. But since they only had snails and little danios and stuff like that with them, it worked out great. And this one looks colorful, healthy, has a really long rostrum. That's odd. I don't think I've ever seen a rostrum quite that long on a, uh, on a neocaridina. But in any case, this is uh, a metaphor for um, your tanks, for fish keeping in general. Just take it slow and easy. Don't add a bunch of chemicals when there's a problem. And then, you know, it starts off a chain reaction. You end up, oh, I added chemicals, so now I've got to add more chemicals to counter the chemicals. And then you start getting into, you put, you know, something to counter the KH. And then you notice your TDS got too high. So you do all these water changes and that stresses it on and on they can deal with stress they can deal with slow and steady stress but they can't deal with those abrupt changes so oftentimes the safest thing to do the number one secret for keeping shrimp is slow and steady don't add those chemicals those antibiotics those antifungals whatever it is because also things like elobiopsidae the uh or iliobiopsidae however you want to say it uh, the green fungus, yellowish green fungus that grows on the underside of these shrimp and kills them that's been a problem in the hobby. You can't do much about it anyways, guys. So, in the end, just get those infected shrimp out. Put them in quarantine. They're probably going to pass away. And other than that, watch their sheds. If their sheds are, are nice and healthy and they're, you don't have any that are getting stuck half-shedded, um, and their sheds aren't completely translucent and kind of like halfway uh, of a shrimp, then you know that they've got enough KH and GH probably in there. They're, they're doing their sheds properly, calcium and carbon and carbon wise. And uh, you're, you're probably good to go. You really don't need to overthink this, especially with Neocaridina, with Bobalti, uh, Amano, uh, ghost shrimp, they're even more hardy, I would say. And I would also say that the Malawa shrimp, the Parapidentis uh, caridina, I think that's another one that's just really solid. So, hope you learned something. I hope, if you already knew this, that you enjoy my little test to see how long these guys could live outside. Looks like we have only one casualty other than the ones eaten by birds and raccoons. Bright yellow and bright red apparently don't work outside uh, in ponds as well because critters eat them. But that's all I have to say today. If you made it this far, please like, subscribe, and if you want to support the channel even more, check out my Teespring, the t-shirts, the artwork that I've got up on there. That's, that supports the channel. Or if you're feeling extra squirrely, you can check out the Patreon. Uh, there should be links to that below, as well as big discounts and prizes uh, to shrimp, invertebrates, and other fish from the various vendors that I work with, uh, that I like, that I support. I've got coupon codes down there that any of y'all can use, even if you're not subscribed. All right, guys, I will talk to you later, and uh, I'll see you next time on The Secret History, living inside your Tupperware shrimp containers.